We'll start off with a disclaimer. So we are funded by the California Department of Healthcare Services, DHCS, and administered through the Center for Applied Research Solutions. While we are very grateful for the funding and institutional support we receive, the views that are about to be expressed here may or may not represent anyone else other than the presenters. We do not anticipate a security challenge, but if there were to be an issue, please know that we have several people in the background who are working to keep this space as safe as possible. In the very small chance that we would have to close down this space, we would send you an email with a new Zoom link. So the CARE TA Center, we are Crisis and Recovery Enhancement TA Center. We are funded through the Mental Health Services Act to provide training and technical assistance regarding crisis continuum of care and justice diversion in the state of California. Ultimately, our goal is to help people recover from behavioral health crises in the community, to stay out of institutions like emergency rooms, locked psychiatric facilities, and jails and prisons, um, unless it's absolutely necessary for somebody to enter those um, spaces. And as you will hear today, oftentimes we can help people recover in the community if we use community defined evidence based practices and culturally responsive practices as well. Our care TA center is fortunate to work with a robust uh, collaboration. We work with RI International, Recovery International, who you will hear from today, Joy and Chuck, also the National Alliance on Mental Illness, California chapter, C4 Innovations, Research and Action Centered Impact Justice, and Stanford Sierra Youth and Families. We hope that you will go to our website and access a variety of resources that we have available from a resource library to an asset map. If you're curious about the crisis care services that are in your community, you can go to our asset map and very quickly learn if you have a mobile crisis unit or crisis line or some other crisis service in your community. We also have additional newsletter and an annual conference that's coming up. Please do connect with us. Um, join our newsletter and you'll learn about all of these resources that we have available. And without further ado, I am so excited to hand the mic over to Joy and Chuck. It is really exciting to have both of them here. And without further ado, I'm going to thank them for being here and thank you all for being here as well. Thank you so much for having us. Um, we will go ahead and get started kind of introducing our, our presentation today. So this is the second um, section of this kind of year long presentation that, that, that we're going to be doing. And today we're going to be talking about the tipping point, kind of where we are in that kind of space of being in the middle of something is about to happen, what, what the motivation and the momentum looks like, uh, what it is, and then how we could all get involved in it. Um, hey, everybody, I'm, I'm Chuck Browning. I go by Dr. Chuck at RI International. I'm the chief medical officer there. I'm also the medical director of Behavioral Health Link, uh, which does mobile support and crisis call centers in uh, the state of Georgia and soon to be several other states. Uh, so very, very much look forward to talking with you today. My name is Joy Brunson in Suga, and um, I'm the vice president of the Southeast for RI International. I have the pleasure of working with Chuck every day. Um, I've worked with Chuck and at RI for about eight years now, and I oversee the Southeast region of the US. Um, and I also specialize in diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, initiatives, and also substance use and medication ass assisted uh, treatment issues as well um, with, with NRI. So a whole host of um, expertise that, that we bring to the table today. Um, some of our learning objectives, we want to make sure that we are clear on, on what we're going to be going over, not only today, but also throughout the entire series. Um, we want to make sure that we bring just real world um, data and examples and research and context for the crisis system in the U.S. Um, we want to make sure that we provide information on the intersection of disparities and inequities in the healthcare system. Um, it is really uh, important to us to ensure that we are looking at a system that is going to be accessible for everyone. And how do we ensure uh, that system is also culturally competent for, for, for everyone? So that's an important um, concern that, that we'll be working through today and in, in all of our presentations. And then um, we will make sure to go over the most up-to-date information on innovation and technology 
in the crisis continuum space, kind of what is coming up for the future and how technology and kind of uh, innovative thinking and next level thinking is really shaping um, the crisis care uh, and continuum space uh, going forward. And then uh, we are planning during this series to really work with each of you um, to analyze your own behavioral health crisis system and to help support that a thought process, uh, determining the foundational elements, the trends, the positives, the areas of, of improvement, and, and to really help um, work through that uh, thought process with you. So let's get started. So one of the um, quotes that we like to think about and, and use, and, and we'll come back to it really repeatedly throughout the presentation and throughout the series is every system is perfectly designed to get the results that, that it gets. Um, so, so considering um, your crisis, your behavioral health crisis system in your area, there were factors and influences and events that happened that really went into um, creating or, you know, the, the direction that that, that system went. And, it, and so it's helpful to remember that every system is designed for the results that it gets. And, and, and so we when we go into a system and kind of start dissecting it and, and, and looking at it, really believing that it's our responsibility to start tweaking those um, de design features in, in order to change that. So here is some of the homework follow-up. Um, previously in our last series, we did talk a lot about um, considering your system and how that system uh, matched or did not match the crisis now model. What were the positives? What, what were the areas of improvement? Um, and then how would crisis adjacent services be um, effective? And then how would your citizens benefit? In a lot of systems around the country, um, Chuck and I do a lot of consulting, not only in um, in California, but a, a, a lot of states as well, we, we see kind of a similar pathway for crisis care. Um, and, and this will be a review for some of you that, that um, attended the, the last series. So for someone who is experiencing a behavioral health um, crisis, there are several ways to enter the, the actual system. So they can be friends and family, um, community-based crisis services, primary care, um, calling 911 and police engagement. Um, these are all ways that individuals kind of reach out when, um, when, when they need support. And oftentimes reaching out is, is the last resort for them or, or their families. Um, but the outcomes are generally pretty, pretty similar. So individuals that in, engage in this pathway can either be sent to the detention center or jailed on, on nuanced crimes or be kind of shunted to a hospital ED. And, and, and we see this time and time again for individuals who, again, at that last resort, they're reaching out for help. And, and, and then they end up in those uh, institutions where it's not really set up for them um, to, to be able to be served for a behavioral health crisis. And, and then from the hospital ED, um, which individuals uh, kind of end up there, they can either be declined services, maybe they're not in crisis enough, um, or, or maybe they can be held there, which is what we call psychiatric boarding, to be able to get into very limited uh, acute in, inpatient beds. So this is kind of the, the pathway uh, that, that we see over and over. And oftentimes individuals, after they've reached out as a very last resort, Oftentimes, they, they can end up without receiving the, the care that they need. So, Joy, if we apply um, Go ahead. If we apply the rules of the system and the design, what does that system design lead to? What kind of outcomes? I mean, so, you talked about the outcomes, but I mean, how does that really play out in a community? So, the, the system is, is designed for individuals to not ask for help. Um, it, it, it is designed for individuals that are in crisis, 
to either kind of suffer in silence or not to get the, the, the help that, that they need. If the direct pathway is to a detention center or an ED that is not set up to handle individuals that have a behavioral health crisis, um, and oftentimes they're not going to receive the care that they need or wait for a significant amount of time for limited inpatient beds, it is designed for individuals to not reach out at all. Yeah. And one of the outcomes of the design too that I always like to point out and think about is, you know, we have created a design where 911 leads to law enforcement being the primary uh, behavioral health supports in encounters out in the community on a day-by-day -day basis. So that's that's how that design results and that's who's coming to help support you. Um, and for good or for bad and pros and cons of that model, but that's what that model does. So the, the crisis now difference is looking to divert individuals away from hospital um, in emergency departments and to either mobile crisis teams um, where individuals can come out into the community wherever someone is and be able to serve them a behavioral health response for a behavioral health emergency. And then uh, take individuals to crisis facilities that are directly designed for, for, for them. And this leads to stabilization in the community, um, individuals being able to stay in their community, getting connected to additional resources um, in, in their actual community where they work, live, and play. And then if someone needs to go to an inpatient a hospital or a higher level of care, then, then that can be uh, worked out as well. Um, but it is designed to ensure that the least restrictive intervention, whether that's mobile crisis or a community-based crisis facility um, is available for individuals. So we wanna match the, the crisis to the actual service that is de designed to support that, that individual. So Chuck, I'm, I'm gonna ask you the question that, that you asked me. So this system, is then designed for what reason to get what result with with the crisis now difference? I think it's two two largest uh, two largest outcomes, or it gives diversion uh, diversion away from two uh, outcomes you're trying to avoid, which is psychiatric boarding in emergency departments and potential uh, jail uh, uh, encounters, as well as helps promote a support to a care model that's designed specifically to help people in crisis. Um, and it's uh, with a focus on it, being able to fit uh, the appropriate care, fit the need that you need. If you just need somebody to come to you and be able to help resolve that, uh, then that's what you get with the model with mobile support. And it can be, get, uh, things can be de-escalated out in the field and uh, follow up set up for that person to help connect them into their recovery path that they want to work on. Uh, if they need something more then there is, uh, Crisis, there are crisis facilities for people who do need that. And so um, I think the, the one piece though in this model that's still present is you're still asking, in this case, there's, there's a, a larger number of people who can not have to see law enforcement as their first encounter, uh, but there still might be a significant presence of, of uh, the interactions between law enforcement and people out in the community. And, and in this model, that the crisis now difference has really come into play after that 911 um, call has, has been made um, and is not taken that 911 interaction or that law enforcement in interaction um, out of the equation. Um, for this situation, though, law enforcement, they are able to respond um, or call mobile crisis to, to assist them, and they're able to take an individual straight to a crisis facility instead of the detention or um, in, instead of the ED. So it does provide options for uh, individuals um, in, in this model. So Chuck, I'm gonna punt it to you to talk about what differences um, that we've seen with, with the model the way that it currently is. And just as a really quick review, just to go back and think about what the crisis model is, it's, a, it's the basic equivalent to emergency medical services. So that we have an equivalent of a call center to, for 911 so that people have someone to call um, that's able to deescalate and divert anywhere from 70 to maybe as high as 85, 90% of calls in the community and help support them there. Um, that works with all 
um, needs in crisis care for call lines. Then part two, an equivalent for EMS or paramedics that you have someone to come to you and that's these mobile support teams. And again, in these cases, numbers in states where they're working uh, to a pretty high fidelity, uh, you're talking about not just coming to emergency departments to see people, but going out in the community, uh, seeing homeless folks uh, underneath the bridge, that type of thing. Um, and again, rates between 65 to 85% of diversion of being able to help settle that situation there. And then finally, um, units where people can go to, uh, and they're not going to be concerned with being too suicidal, too violent, too intoxicated, need medical clearance through the ED. All those the infrastructure mm -hmm. is built into the facilities that mm -hmm. take uh, these folks in and say yes. And through that process, they're able to uh, be able to create a major impact in both healthcare savings, but also helping people find the correct care fit to need. So here's some of the outcomes in, uh, in the Phoenix area. This was a, done back in 2017. Uh, where we're talking about the Maricopa County, a population of about 4 million uh, folks in that greater uh, Phoenix area. And here's some of the things you saw. So a six times better crisis clinical care fit to need, whereas a lot of times in that old model that we just showed you, one of the outcomes of that design is that people either are sent back home or they're uh, petitioned for involuntary commitment to go to inpatient units. So there's nothing in between. So nothing like what we have for medical problems in our emergency system where we have different levels of care, for example, with chest pain, different levels of um, challenges with that. In that one year in 2017, the work in being able to help law enforcement know that they could drop someone off at these facilities in the, with no questions asked and be in and out in five minutes or less led to savings of 37 FTE police officers that then could be re-engaged into public safety instead of supporting and working in behavioral health outcomes. So the design of that system um, has led to law enforcement still being pretty heavily involved in transport and in uh, working with that. And so there are three different crisis service units in that throughout that whole community that serve uh, the whole area and they're specifically geographically located in, in a spread pattern. But basically law enforcement in that area can either voluntarily take someone over to the facility and drop them off or if someone is on an involuntary uh, basis because of concerns of their safety and it is literally a five minute drop off and they're in and out. So there's, it makes it really easy to take those persons to care rather than uh, take them to jail or, or, or go wait uh, you know, at that emergency room for hours and hours or days, which happens to a lot of law enforcement officers. Mm -hmm. It saved 45 years just in that one year in 2017 of hospital boarding time in the uh, psychiatric, uh, excuse me, in emergency departments while waiting for psychiatric picks. 45 years in one year of 2017. $260 million in a overall uh, cost savings. On, on just health spend only, doesn't even take into account community costs and different judicial things. And $37 million avoided in costs and losses to the specific hospitals related to how much it cost them to have people boarded in emergency departments um, and those types of things. And then finally, um, you know, when you have people going to hopefully specifically to an area that's designed to help support them in a warm, welcoming environment with the use of recovery oriented principles, peer support services, collaboration, connection to family and community, those types of things is priceless, the difference you can make. Absolutely. And, and as, as I'm looking at all of the difference that um, just that one kind of change in, in the crisis continuum, that crisis pathway made, I'm, I'm thinking which one of these would be the, the most important for me um, as, as I'm working in, in the community. Um, and, and, and there's several of, of them that are most important to me. Um, I, I'm curious, Chuck, which, which one stands out to you out, out, of, the, out of these differences? Well, you know, my, you know me, my personality really well, Joy. I'm always going to go with the priceless mm -hmm. care that feels like care. <laughs> That's yeah. always going to be mine. Yes, uh, I, I I knew it. That that one is is, is one that, that's important to me as well. And then I, I think um, that clinical fit to me, make, making sure people are, when, when they're asking for help, they are getting the best fit for them. And, and, and then also having um, less involvement um, for individuals that are really there and designed to work in public safety, um, making sure that they're able to do what they do best and for the behavioral health system to be able to kind of 
step in and take care of the individuals that we um, ha have been trained to work with and in the way that 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 we do best. And, and the best part of that, those outcomes, Joy, is that even though like care is the most important to me, um, when you get a win-win where it's both a business case that's a win-win plus is a yeah. better care situation, um, it's not often that you get it. And I think that's one of the reasons there's so much momentum in this movement now at this current time. And that's yeah. part of the tipping point. That, that is part of the, the tipping point is that this is where we were prior to the, the tipping point. Um, we talked a lot about this in our first presentation, really looking at the historical factors of why the system came to be and, and, and then what is happening. Um, but being at, at the tipping point now really uh, takes it to the, to, to the next level. So now we're, we're, we're at a place um, in our country where we're looking at 988, where we're, we're looking at all of the different factors that have come into play, I would say in the last 18 to 20 months, um, whether that has been um, racial unrest, uh, whether that has been the pandemic, um, there's so much legislation right now around um, crisis services and then the implementation of, of, of 988. Um, that will be July of 2022. So we are, all of this is coming together, this motivation, this, this momentum to move the call, the original call that, that we have been talking about as the way for someone to access um, that, that crisis pathway and move it to a separate number, the, this 988 number where individuals will be able to access um, the, the crisis pathway in a different way. Um, still the family, the friends, all, all of that, but being able to not call 911, but to call 988 and, and to be able to directly in, engage um, in that call center, to be able to directly uh, get mobile crisis uh, out to where the person is and then have access to that, to that crisis facility. So we're at the tipping point of even going a step farther than all of, all of the differences that, that we have previously discussed. So, so what does that do? Um, this, this is one of the, the, the slides that, that I, I like to use. Everybody knows mon Monopoly. Um, and, and, and so just being able to bypass um, the jails and then, then we sent individuals directly to the hospital. And, and, and now we're looking at bypassing that for individuals, especially individuals of, of, of color that have um, a lot of feelings around calling 911 or having uh, justice and in, in involvement. It, it helps to be able to now consider, are there different options? Um, of course, law enforcement will always be a partner um, as a community stakeholder, but looking at can we provide different options for individuals that is less traumatizing um, and when that system, as I talked about before, is designed for individuals not to reach out. Is, it is designed if I have to call 911 and have an officer come to me and I have um, different feelings around that, then Will this new uh, option in the system allow individuals to reach out sooner so, so that they're not waiting to the last possible possible second? I was just going to say, I mean, I just a, a perfect story. I, I've even, I've worried about this as a local community psychiatrist about, you know, I'm really concerned about this person I'm working with, that they're um, escalating up into a situation where they're um, uh, maybe psychiatric symptoms are, are putting them in danger. And I'm worried about that. And how sad is it that also in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about how can I help if this person doesn't want to go get help. And I think they need a little bit higher level of care for a short term to help stabilize. How can I help do that? And also be fearful of what's going to happen if, because they look like a large dangerous person to just in terms of implicit bias. And am I, am I putting them in more danger calling for help to get them support versus not. It is a constant challenge that I know families go through um, and, and even us in, in treatment teams worry about that and how do we best uh, do that. So I'm really excited about the potential opportunity for change in this design, the system design. Absolutely, absolutely. So the, the, the future state, and we're, we're right on the verge of this, 
um, is having 911 for the same reasons, of course, medical emergency or public safety threat. That is why um, we will call 911 and not have it as the complete default for, for, for all crises or, or concerns that, that, that we have. And then have 988 and have a real call center crisis hub um, where individuals are able to get the, the support that they need. And, and as you can see, this, this pathway has different um, kind of turns in it. So of course, if you have a medical emergency, um, then the hospital is, is, is the best place for, for, for you to go. If there's a threat to public safety, an actual threat to, to, to public safety, then police involvement um, is, is, is needed. But, but then also having direct access to um, behavioral health services, mobile crisis um, through the, the, the 988 number um, and access to the crisis uh, facilities and then also to that higher level of care if needed, if the lower level of, of, of care um, is, is not exactly what that person needs. So this is the future state of crisis care and we're right on the edge of it. Um, we are around the country every week um, talking to individuals about their uh, crisis continuum and, and all states right now are looking at how to implement 988, how to ensure that individuals are able to get the, the, the care that they need. And, and so all of this information is right at the forefront of our minds right now as being the next level of, of crisis care and our responsibility to make sure that 988 number is supported by having the appropriate mobile crisis and crisis facilities available. So multiple states, counties, and local stakeholders, providers are, are really, really looking at and considering how how do we how do we move into this crisis now difference? How do we support our communities and make sure that there is access? Um, and mm -hmm. we get to we get the pleasure of working with so many different communities, counties, states as they're developing their 988 system and the things that flow through it. And what I will say is for every one community you visit, you've seen one community. <laughs> I mean, everyone is designing yeah. variations. I mean, there's a real strong consensus about having these three pieces of the crisis now model, but I, I see some major tensions aligning between how to do each of those three. We'll probably save that for our next talk in shaping the future, mm -hmm. but uh, that's part yeah. of what we can explore in these questions is where your communities are so that we can, uh, I'm sure we'll find a new way that someone is working on that in their area. Yeah. Every, every community that, that we go to um, says almost the same line is that we are unique. Um, and, and oftentimes that is very true. Um, there are certain um, cultural aspects, uh, certain customs, politics, all of that, that really go into shaping the, the, the way that a, um, a crisis system will, will, will need to operate. So we're going to stop here and get into hopefully um, some discussion. Um, this, this collaborative is really designed for us to have some dialogue around um, what you're seeing what you're experiencing, and again, as as I said from the uh, from the beginning, really push on that thought process, so so that we're not talking at you, but we are listening to you and working with you through your thought process of what's happening at your own agency in within your own counties, and and how can you be in, involved in the discussion and the move towards. Um, a, a crisis now model in, in your area. Um, and right now we're going to talk about just the, these pieces um, on the crisis pathway that, that we just uh, went over. So some of the questions that we have to kind of spark some thoughts, some reflections on your own um, counties and, and in your own environment will uh, are, 
how will 988 implementation impact your system? So how does this number, this call center that is coming out specifically for behavioral health crises um, so that individuals in crisis will not call 911, but what they will call this number to have direct access to that call center. Um, mobile crisis can, can, can be sent out and then also um, a, a place for people to go. Uh, two is what are the current influences in your system that would promote change? Um, we previously talked about why your system is the way that it is. Um, and, and, and we're hoping that everyone is here to start looking at what can we do to move towards a, a model that, that, that works for everyone. So what are the current influences in your system that would promote change? Thinking of that tipping point, motivation, change, change happens by influence. What, what, what are those? And who are the current major players that need to be involved in, in, in the conversation? Um, none of this happens through a siloing system or a vacuum. We all have to be collaborative and, and really work together. There's lots of stakeholders in every community that will need to be a part of that. And so for you, who are those people? Uh, and, and if you can start putting some answers in, in the chat, um, if, if you're comfortable doing so, or um, you can unmute and uh, talk to us about what, what you're seeing. And I'm gonna go to the chat. Chuck, do you see some answers in the chat? Not yet. We've got our questions listed in the chat so you can see them all three. Okay. Maybe so some, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, if you just think about, you know, again, going back to we're we're talking, oh, here we go. Dominic says a clear pathway between local school districts and county care crisis systems, working separately, but also together. Mm -hmm. Oh, also uh, mics are live, and so a participant can unmute if, if someone would like to be able to, to talk. Absolutely. I'm just gonna May talk because I'm feeling lazy today. <laughs> <laughs> Typing Love is too it. much. Um, so I think so. <clears throat> I'm in Siskiyou County, and I work for the County Behavioral Health. Um, and this is something that we've talked a lot about, and we're trying to come up with solutions. We're going to hire a contractor because we just don't have the capacity to try to figure it all out ourselves. But you know, we're the the fifth largest county in the state. We're over six thousand square miles. We're huge, but we have so few people. And trying to figure out a way that we can provide these types of, of crisis services to our community is daunting. Um, so we can start yes. with like our, our major cities, but you know, getting all of the police departments, all of the um, sheriffs and everything in, in line with that is definitely a challenge where everybody agrees that we need to do it, but finding that right solution that's gonna work for everybody and work for our population you know, because some of the areas in our county are just completely unsafe for a, um, a mobile crisis uh, responder to go to if they don't have civil standby. And civil standby might take three hours to get there. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So there's yeah. a lot of challenges. So I'm just I'm curious to hear other people and really of um, if somebody else is responding of sharing what size area you're in is helpful. So I can try to hear if other people are in rural or frontier counties would be great. And I, I can totally relate. I, I, I label that in my top five of challenges for the 988 uh, tipping point roll down of, of barriers to face is how to support people when the, with this geographic spread and what does the system need to have uh, to be able to, to support that. Right. And the challenge with 9882 is, you know, we've done a lot of work to get people to utilize our 24 seven crisis line and then changing it again is um, is going to be a challenge as well. So of trying to come up with a way that 988 will work with our uh, 24 hour crisis response as well. Which ties in with what Paul just said, which is I'm concerned about volume diverted to local crisis teams. And so in every system currently that has some crisis services, this model that's very innovative and a game changer uh, definitely creates pressures on current services that are already there. Um, do they have the technology? Do they have the infrastructure to be able to support such a thing? If they don't, how can, uh, how can your local community support those changes and be able to, to do those things? Those are, um, you know, just a, 
it's just, it's a part of this whole momentum moving forward is this uh, challenge, but yeah, opportunity to do it in a, in a much, much better uh, proven way in a lot of different communities, but spread that ability to do it countrywide. Mm -hmm. Hi, I hope you don't mind me talking. Um, so I also live in a relatively, or work in a relatively rural district. Um, we have, I work in a school district with about 10,000 students, but I'm just thinking county-wise for us, I, the biggest issue I see with implementation is just having enough people to actually make this happen. We don't even have it in existence now, and we already have a lack of mental health services. Like I'm having to send students, you know, hour, two hours away to get services, and then trying to create this, there's just not enough funding to pay the people out here. And then when they do offer funding, you know, they don't offer a pay that people are willing to take to drive out here. So that's my bigger concern is trying to figure out, it's a great idea, but how are they even going to get enough manpower to physically staff it, especially because of how rural things are and how far things are. I just don't see people even wanting to drive out here to provide the service. So there you go, Catherine. So, so staffing, is, is it also in my top five of this new rollout of one of the major, major challenges that we have uh, to deal with and made even more uh, you know, impressive uh, if you want to use that word to describe it with this, what people are calling the great resignation of 2021. So it puts mm -hmm. even more pressure on being able to do that. I, I think one of the things that we're going to see just as in 911 with 988 on the call centers and, and also in mobile teams um, and also in our call facilities is an increase. Um, you, I think we're going to have a decreased reliance on specifically just uh, certain levels of mental health professionals. Uh, meaning I think there should be more and more opportunities for folks with lived experience, especially in crisis. Uh, it's a proven and a best practice to show um, and share uh, people who've walked in people's path and been in their shoes, uh, not necessarily to prescribe medications or to do types of therapy, but in short crisis interventions, that role is so powerful. Um, and, but that also means uh, training, support, uh, different states have different regulations about that. I know California's had their... Um, you know, work on peer certification and, and the role of peers and that, that type of thing. So there's a, there's a lot uh, to move forward in that piece is with workforce challenges. And then there's specific training for any role in this crisis continuum to support crisis practices rather than maybe working in a classic outpatient or inpatient behavioral health setting. And then I, I, I would just add on, on my list, um, being a clinically trained therapist, um, I, I I think the funding um, of this and the pressure on the system to be adequately funded, if not past adequate. Um, I've worked in community mental health nonprofit world my entire career, and there's a lot of expectation to do more with less. Um, and to do it without a margin, to do it um, underfunded, but you still have to do it, right? And, and provide this great service with the burden of increasing documentation. Um, so I, I, I think the wave that we're seeing right now and the focus at, at the federal level to really make sure that this number is supported and that we have um, uh, the crisis system for behavioral health that, that we need, I, I think will also shine the light on what the expectation has been um, for people who are working in the system, for counties who are funding it by themselves, all, all of that um, I, I feel will, will come to light. Um, will it happen overnight? I, I don't think so. Um, last week, we were at a leadership retreat in, um, in Arizona, and we were talking about when the 911 number came into play in 1967. Did I get that right? Nin 1967. And, and, and we were uh, looking at the Imagine song and John Lennon, and, and we were talking about how 13 years later, the system that had um, everybody was working on, he was still taken to the hospital in the back of a, of a police car. 
even with all of the work that that had been done, um, it was still 13 years later, still working on it. And, and, and so I, I think the push right now is to get that, get that ball rolling um, so, so that we can shine the light on all of the inequities in the system, um, specifically funding, um, where the, the difference between a behavioral health crisis system funding and a medical system funding is a huge difference. Um, the, the, the pay is, is, is very different. The staffing is, is, is very different. Um, so, so that is one of the things that I believe is, is going to come into play as we continue to push forward with having a behavioral health crisis system that has open access for individuals to be able to really get the, the, the help that, that they need. So I, I totally hear what, what you're saying. Um, and, and we're going to have to adjust in, in order to um, a, attract individuals to want to work in, in, in this field. Um, we, we've hit on some of the positives and also potential areas of improvement um, around 988 implementation and impact. Volume is definitely on the top of everyone's um, thought process right, right now and, and, and what that's going to look like. Um, as, as well as the interaction that 988 is going to have to have with, with 911, as 911 is another number that's ingrained into everyone's mind um, to, to call when, when they get to that point. Um, and, and then I hope for all of us to start thinking about who are those individuals that we really need to make sure are involved in, in the conversation. Um, and and I, I would encourage for us to think about not just the individuals that we usually have involved in the, the, the conversation, but individuals that may need to access these services, um, different um, diversity groups, all of that, as we are really looking at making sure that the, the system works for individuals and is welcoming for someone to come when they, they need assistance or to or like mobile response to, to, to come out to them. Uh, but, but this is the basis uh, of helping describe what crisis now is. And it's, um, you know, anyone, anywhere, anytime, uh, creating some of these core pillars of, of a equivalent to 911, EMS, and emergency departments that we have for emergency medical care. And so if you see that, you know, you've got someone to call. Um, and like, as I said, crisis call center hubs, when when you put the functionality of how these things are supposed to practice, the details and the recommendations, um, when you combine these, these three core services, along with technology to support it in an air traffic control type manner that watches and follows that person from the time they get connected to support until they get connected to a safe um, uh, situation, and then combine it with uh, what, what's called essential care practices and principles. Of uh, for crisis care, which involves things like um, peer supports, um, safer suicide initiatives, and, and systems and processes within what you do, um, re a recovery oriented approach with trauma informed care, uh, coordination and safety with for law enforcement and, and emergency medical services. When you put those things together, uh, that is the basis for the toolkit for the SAMHSA's National Toolkit for Behavioral Health Care. It's taking this crisis now, which is uh, created by the National. Associated State, the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors, or NASHBID, um, and then uh, was added in with those layers to create the National Toolkit. And it's about an 80 page type um, free download on SAMHSA if you want to go into deeper dive details of how some of these principles are supposed to work. But again, it creates a system that can help more and more people as you go further along the line, or you have less people that need the highest level of care. And when you do that, it really changes the, the game in valve flow management so that it's not just you have to stay in the community or you go to an inpatient bed. There's lots of layers of continual treatment in it. And so, you know, at RI, we've been uh, working in multiple states. Um, there's actually more now. We're now in 10 states and combined with uh, Behavioral Health Link, who is doing uh, crisis call centers and uh, mobile support teams in Georgia, but also soon to be in Ohio and Virginia, 
as well as working on electronic technology supports for some of those systems, we're seeing this play out in multiple different states. Um, it's really cool to, in terms of the tipping point, to see this consensus um, of design by most states to say, hey, we need to create this equity, this um, equal model of care and parity for um, psychiatric and, and substance use emergencies that we have for emergency medical care. Um, and I, I think, like I said, the devil is in the details in terms of figuring out how each place is going to do that. Um, one of the great things when you do look at the history of 911 and emergency services is, you know, we have decades now of looking at different emergency medical problems and being able to pull research and data about what works and what doesn't work that now gives you really strong guidelines that whether you go to um, a rural ED in one place in the East Coast versus a metropolitan area in the West Coast, there's certain standards of care for certain major medical emergency events that are studied and, and followed to a pretty close guideline at most of these facilities. And likewise, that's something I really look forward to as a tipping point kind of movement is to start that process so that we can start continuing to even understand more how that works. So as we move forward and looking at this, um, one way that it's, it's got to work to help make it, to let it be successful is to, each of these services has to be able to say yes and has to be able to create access. So you have to have 24 seven call service that's always answering the phone and being able to help support and connect people um, to uh, what they need in that moment. When mobile support teams, they have to be able to say yes and have access to be able to get out and connect to different areas. And we've already talked about some of the challenges as we look and implement and plan on how to make that happen. And then finally at these uh, freestanding uh, crisis services, if they're truly gonna replace people going to the emergency department, you have to have the infrastructure in place to be able to help support uh, problems with medical issues that come up. Uh, so you need 24 seven nursing, you need uh, intensive medical support from a provider to be able to help work with the things that oftentimes come along with substance use and behavioral health crisis challenges. Um, sometimes folks who are dealing with serious mental illness challenges. Um, so there's a lot that goes into being able to do that and, and also uh, being able to say yes and be able to keep people safe. Um, and so we talk about at RI, we have this saying called the RI way, and we modeled it after Disney World. And basically Disney uses four keys to help guide their staff about how to do this and how to be able to give consistency for, for staff to understand how to do things in a safe way create access and courtesy to, to, to guests of the park, but have a really consistent theme. And so they're able to go through those keys that when they're running into a situation with a guest that they're serving in the parks. And their goal is to create a, a fun experience for families. Um, with RI, our goal is to create an experience of caring environment uh, for, so that people that come to our facilities are gonna be uh, treated uh, in, a, in a caring way that is very important, we feel like, in helping decrease the length of stay, helping people feel supported, helping people feel hope about a chance for recovery when they're in the middle of their crisis and de-escalate that crisis faster. And so we actually gave our staff a similar type of keys designed after Disney's method, and we call that the RI way. And so we always focus on safety first, then focus on no matter what, the next level, whatever you're doing with guests, you gotta be engaged, you gotta be present, you gotta be out on the floor working with people, connecting with people, looking them in the eye, um, using the appropriate language. Um, the, the next level is right there in about the same rank as engagement is peer powered. And we talk about peer powered practices. That's in our co-design, but also in the practices that we do with other, with the people that we serve. That includes things like uh, being focused on strengths and not just weaknesses. So what's strong and not just what's wrong in that moment of crisis and help people hang on to their strengths as they're working on solving through their crisis. Uh, being collaborative. It's so often when people are dealing with their crisis systems now that they get run through a process and have things done to them instead of things done with them. So working on as, as your community is developing practices, being really thoughtful about how to create choice and comfort as much as possible for people when they're in a crisis situation. And then one of the most important things for both safety as well as the way people feel cared for is a trauma-informed approach. Um, and in in the lens of that, I think there's nothing more powerful than peer support to do that, not just for the people that come into counter encounter our peers, but also for the effects that peer support has if it's truly integrated into a multidisciplinary team. So that a provider, a nurse, a clinician, 
gets the same exposure and thoughts about empathy. What's it like for this person? What are they going through? Yes, I have to see these eight or 10 guests in a certain amount of time and I have to do these notes, but there is nothing more powerful than to be able to constantly check in with yourself and be thinking about that, you know, where is this person coming from and how can I have empathy about their situation, their crisis, even if they're yelling at me and angry about the situation. Um, and then finally, performance. You have to have certain infrastructure in place with electronic health records, um, efficiency and system design so that you have efficient flows, minimizing chance for errors and dangerous situations. Um, and you never want to sacrifice efficiency and performance for being engaged with someone or for being using peer powered practices with people. But you also, it makes it easier if you're efficient so that people don't have to wait, you're not making mistakes, that staff knows what they're supposed to do in those roles. It, it creates a system of constant quality improvement and we feel like it, it is an important key that we just don't rank it as high as the others. And so those, that's how we put those four things together to think about it. And I'll share that with you just to be thinking that this is something as you're designing your system and you want it to be some, a place that your loved one or family member would be served in your community um, to be put some thought and work into how you do that and how you implement that. So when we talk about where can crisis go, we use that fusion model to describe this combination of being able to say yes to everyone and not having a wrong door, because if you do, then, pull, then either law enforcement or first responders or mobile teams, are, it's not going to be as convenient for them to want to bring people to your site. Um, it makes people have to go through the emergency department, which then also creates pressure, potentially, if it's law enforcement, they're transporting someone to say, I just, it's just easier for me to book them on a nuisance crime. Um, but then at the same time of creating that access so that people are cared for and connected to care, that you have that recovery oriented approach that, uh, that would be the kind of thing you'd want for your family member or loved one or yourself. And Chuck, I would add in not only the no wrong door for the facility component of this, but also for the mobile response component Correct. of this as, as, as well as the call center component of this. Um, each of these different levels um, must be able to respond when someone needs that, that source of care and in order for individuals to continue to, to actually access or reach out for, for that support. And so we call that the fusion model. It's pulling those th two things together. And just to share just a little bit more, you know, I'm such a believer in the power of uh, peer support and what it does. Um, it's had a major influence in my career um, and, and working in with RI over half of our staff um, around the country as folks with lived experience. Um, and it, uh, you know, we always talk about peer first, peer last. So at our crisis facilities, the first person someone's going to see, even if they're brought in by police, now the back of a police car is someone with lived experience who can say, hey, I'm kind of set expectations for what what's going on um, hopefully be able to say hey I've walked in your shoes and I want to help help you have some hope that we're going to help support you care for you and help work with you to be empowered to feel like you're going to be able to uh, leave out of here and be um, on a step of a recovery pathway whether you're just starting it or getting back on it. but we added in things as we've been working towards this a, a markedly increase in peer leadership and so I encourage you in your development of your systems whether it's at a particular organization or looking at the whole uh, situation to think about peer leadership in voice and co-design and things like that but in particular units and in mobile teams there also needs to be peer leadership on a day-by-day -day role to to help support making sure we're keeping leaned into those practices and actually having tools that help measure recovery oriented approaches and are, do people feel cared for and those things like that and, and as Chuck was saying earlier, um, having individuals um, thinking outside of just the usual kind of clinical medical um, uh, roles really will support um, the workforce shortages and also create um, welcoming, compassionate care. So going outside of what we would um, usually think of as a as, as support uh, in, in a crisis situation. I'm um, thinking about that, that peer level uh, camaraderie and support and understanding from someone who's, who's been there. And SAMHSA's National Toolkit does recommend the use of peer support in all of um, the three lanes of crisis now um, okay. in different roles. Um, and this is just an example of one of the peer power practices with really big focus as we develop these systems. Remember, a system is designed to do what it's, what it's designed to do. So if you design 
on your system to be collaborative so you can do things with the person. Um, you're going to create more comfort and choice, a less traumatic environment, whereas so much of our system is designed now to make a person feel like a number and a widget going through a process that they don't have any choice. And oftentimes people describe, you know, even when dealing with severe suicidality, for example, I will, I've heard the quote, I will never go back to the emergency department, no matter how bad I feel. I'll never go through that again. And so creating a system so that we create a warm and welcome centers that do that, that connect with people. Um, this is one of our, uh, just an example of a RI uh, international location where uh, we've created just different units, different levels of care um, with, with, within one building. So it doesn't matter um, how someone accesses that system, whether they walk in, they get referred, there are different levels of care, including a mobile response in the, the, the same location. Uh, so, so that individuals are able to access the, the, the care that they need. So you can kind of see this campus now in this picture of different services all working together on the same unit of campus so that you've got different layers and levels of care. And uh, another big part of that is thinking about, you know, we talk about in crisis now the three components uh, that are important to have an equivalent to emergency medical services. But a big thing to think about as you're designing your system is hopefully with the cost savings that you have and being able to really uh, create this diversion pathway. Uh, and this has been true in Arizona to be able to reinvest into more preventative services, step down services, services that help coordinate and support social determinants of health that have a big effect on people's crises, things like that. And Chuck, I think we're calling those uh, crisis adjacent services. Yes. The prevention, um, because prevention is, is, is really important. And, and for those individuals that are considering crisis services, yes, we are very specific around um, the crisis now model and what crisis services are, but crisis services are uh, only as good as the prevention in the area and also the follow-up. So we are also looking um, at that crisis adjacent services so that we are supporting the community and the, and the community is supporting the, the, the services as well. This is an example of what um, one of our units look like. Again, this is just to get the thought process going of those warm, welcoming spaces. Uh, yes, we have recliners. Yes, we have open spaces, all of that. But we are really looking at collaboration, um, being welcomed, being comfortable, um, and, and all of that um, all with, with, within one space. So, so that individuals, when they're, they're in a crisis or mobile crisis wants to come, um, and, and, and bring someone or a family member comes, uh, we, we always say if, if, my, if I will bring my family member to one of the services that, that I provide, then that's a, a, a really good service. If, if I wouldn't, then I need to reconsider what those services are designed to do and what outcome that I don't want my family member to experience. And this is just some more pictures of just different designs in, in different states um, of how that interpretation of the, the crisis now model in terms of facilities, what it looks like kind of on, on the inside. Open space, open sight lines, uh, joint commission safe in terms of inpatient things. Uh, but at the same time, hopefully warm and welcoming, no plexiglass to separate staff from guests so that you really have an environment that creates safety, but also encourages engagement. Yes. So we are back to some question and discussion and, you know, food for thought. Um, so after uh, listening to not only the components of the crisis now model, um, and then also uh, our eyes interpretation of the crisis now model. Again, there are different organizations that interpret the three components differently, um, but, but this is the, the way that 
um, the company that we represent uh, in, in interprets the, the, the different lanes. Um, here are the questions. And again, you can unmute or you can put the information um, in the chat. Uh, what pieces of the crisis now model do you have in, in your area? What pieces of the crisis now model would your area benefit from implementing? And how would you fuse your system with no wrong door access and quality care? Alondra said, I love that system of crisis aid adjacent services. We have that here in Sacramento County and we would benefit from transport and medical care on the mobile team. Yes, think, thinking about how the systems can overlap, right? We, we, because there are gonna be situations where a mobile team will go out and it's actually a medical um, it, it emergency or uh, vice versa. Um, so really thinking of this as an all-inclusive model um, and that there's got to be that collaboration, that partnership, so, so that individuals can get the care that they need and that it's still a, a no wrong door approach because the mobile teams can go out or the crisis adjacent services can go out and still call for the correct level of treatment while still being being with that person. So it, it still has that no wrong door feel. That person still feels supported. This is just an, an, an example and a visual of, again, if, if someone has experienced a, a, a bad day with a car wreck, um, there are options for individuals. So again, looking at that parity within the medical system and transposing that over into the behavioral health system so that we have that same level of equity and access. And I think someone mentioned about the rural areas um, and considering what the needs are, are, are there. Um, uh, across the, the, the country, the challenge is to ensure that this is not a boutique model. It is not a model that screens out if, if someone um, has aggression in their background uh, or if someone comes in and speaks a different language. Um, it is a model that is really a crisis care for everyone. And, and, and so rethinking how to handle medical challenges, um, having someone go to the ED, for an example, for medical clearance, um, knowing that there are different um, health disparities within certain populations, a lot of individuals kind of get stuck um, in, in that part and, and not being able to access services. So really being able to think about crisis care for everyone and making sure that there are not barriers to care that really show biases, stigma, and disparities with, with, within the, the, the system. That is really important that the population of that community feels supported. Thank you, best wishes to everyone.